Okay, I forgot a cable. Jasper had to run away and go look for a cable for me. Otherwise, he'd be here and we'd be almost ready to start on time. No, I know it's going to be hard for people to come. Um, okay, I'll be done. This camera is now broadcasting, and that one's also doing stuff, but I can't sit with my camera now. Okay, I forgot a cable. Yes, right. I forgot a cable. Otherwise, you'd be here. Jasper's computer can't hook up to the projector. <laughs> okay, it's gone to look for one. Hmm? Yeah, it's gone to look for one in Botany. Decided that we didn't have enough time to, um, to drop down. So you don't have one yet, I guess. I thought you had one already. No, I'm just... Yeah, what is in computer, in computer, in two? We are live on YouTube now. Yeah, there's someone at this one too. Yeah, so I mean, I just muted their volume. You can actually hear them fine. Okay. But, um, you said mute their volume. Um, where are you going to sit and stand? Sit such stand there. Um, yeah, I'll probably sit here some just 
give it a second. Um, just wait. This is really weird, but I've never done this broadcast via Google Hangouts. So there's an on-air thing you can do, but it actually works on like a 30-second lag. So I'm watching the past, and that's very yeah, hard to focus. The, I don't know where the camera is. Maybe they'll be able to keep it. Hmm? Uh, let's move this. Let's move this in the lights. Yeah. People can read my email. So we just stop to so Started this side. Um, I'm, I'm going to mute you guys, so if you uh, just to avoid background noise. So if you need anything, then um, then send me a, a, a text message. Cool. Can you do it? I've uh, I've shifted it. You you won't see me. I shifted it to my screen. That's so. Yeah, I was seeing Firefox, but not supposed to be shared. We're we're on Chrome. Uh, so, guys, we didn't have to be the other So thanks everyone for coming. Once we finish the technology, I think Jasper's setting the bar high, and now we have to sort of simulcast all of the talks, and I just got to request on Twitter to record them. I don't know if that's happening or not, but anyway. Um, and then Jasper's also going to do a hard part, which basically put the, the old material online already, so the bar is high now. So this is Dr. Jasper Sinkley, he works for San Diego Sayon, one of his um, organizations, and I'm very happy to have him in the talk, and that's all. Oh, he said thank you to our sponsor. He has the uh, I love our stickers and the t shirt. We're going to have one. Oh, Justin. <laughs> cool. I'm just trying to see if these guys are with us yet. Are you guys with us yet? David, can you hear me? Now then. Yeah, uh, we're trying to switch to Chrome from Firefox. Okay. And did you get the link to the document I sent? Yes. So I have that. Maybe you could just follow on that document and then listen to listen to what I have to say as we go. Cool. Okay, sorry guys. So I'm going to sit so that um, they can hear me um, properly. Um, and essentially, I've put together um, a whole a document that I posted on the web, so if you want to write down that link, it will probably be up there for most of the talk, um, then you can get hold of the document. And I'll probably spend more time making it an easy to read document and being able to work out yourself in the document than in clipping what I would actually say to the document. So, uh, um, so I hope this is useful. But if this session isn't useful, then it's the document. Um, is that the size that everyone can see? So this is kind of just a, so the idea is that I'm just going to give you a background of you know, how to help yourself work with spatial data. Um, 
because playing with R really is about fiddling with it enough to figure out what's really going on. And, uh, and you can borrow code and find things and do with things and that helps you plunk it all together, but you only really learn by hitting a problem that you can't solve for three days and then somebody walks in and fixes it for you in like 20 seconds. So, um, so this is just kind of a list of topics I'm going to cover. Firstly, just fan task views. Um, I think it's something that wasn't covered in any of the previous sessions, and the idea that there are these kind of sets of packages that have been put together on different themes, and so you can install a whole set um, in one go, and then you're able to aware for any topic you're interested in, it's phylogenetics or spatial data or econometrics or, or whatever, and we'll, I'll, I'll show you some of the examples in a bit. Then just a kind of a, a list of do-it-yourself resources, useful links, and um, and then um, some kind of do it yourself resources and interesting links that can show you some cool tricks you can do in R. Um, and then I'll go into a practical example and we'll kind of work through some code dealing with different kinds of data objects and, and so on. Um, cool. So, can task views, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the can link for downloading anything R. Um, if you look on the left side, there's this little thing that says task views. And if you click on that, you'll see um, something like this. It's a better resolution. It is a screen capture just to, uh, just so I didn't have to flip the backwards and forwards and the internet wasn't working and so on. You get something like this, and it's got a long list of different things Bayesian um, clinical trials, cluster analyses, distribution, economics, and so on and so forth. So we're going to be playing with some packages from spatial down here. And the cool thing is, if you want to install the whole set of packages for a different um, task view, you just need to follow this little bit of code at the bottom here. So they wrote a package called CTD plan task views, and it has a little function called install views. And you say install views and the name of, it, of, the, of, of the task view you want to install, and off it goes. But be warned, it can take a very long time if it's, um, if it's, a, big, if it's a big package. So the spatial package, I think, has like near 100. Um, especially if you have know, a package of another set of like that. If anyone has any questions along the way, just stick your hand up. I'm just going to yeah. talk louder. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. So that's kind of the set of task views and how you install it. And then if you go into one, it'll have this kind of summary of all of the packages for that particular task view. So this is the one for spatial. Um, it's been put together by Roger Bavan. Um, and kind of goes through various topics and the different packages that do different things. So um, under this one, the topic covered covered into you know, classes for spatial data, handling spatial data, reading and writing spatial data. Uh, but then he gets into like the more statistical um, stuff, so into point pattern analysis, geostatistics, and so on and so forth. So he's kind of given you a really nice summary here of um, what the different packages do and which ones are useful for what and so on. And so that because R is kind of a community project, um, you'll find there's a million ways of doing any one thing you want to do. Um, but before there's a standard for any kind of field, um, there's all kinds of so you'll work on one theme, one set of packages for a long time, and then you'll hit a dead end and realize the thing you want to do, you really need to be using some other package for. Unfortunately, a bunch of guys kind of realized this maybe four or five years ago when it comes to the spatial packages, and they've been writing a lot of kind of conversion tools and trying to um, consolidate things into a particular package in a particular format. Um, so the ones we're going to be dealing with today um, are just a couple of more popular libraries that have been um, that kind of sit more centrally, and then everything else branches off. Some useful do-it-yourself resources, obviously this task view page, um, and then there's a bunch of others. There's uh, NEON Data Skills, NEON is the National Environmental Observatory Network in the US, um, and those are just some cool, they're not that useful for looking up a particular thing you want to do, but if you're interested in having a look at the cool things you can do, um, they've got some really nice tutorials to play with, um, and fiddling with LiDAR and all kinds of things, hyperspectral imagery and all kinds of things. Um, and then uh, NC is the National Center for um, Ecological Analysis and Synthesis in the States. They've also got a lot of different uh, packages. And then there's a couple of others. And then Google Go is useful. Um, and then there's a great book, um, which gives you a good overview of 
um, everything that you're handling data through the Trend model. Um, and, and so to move on to the practical example, um, so so um, I'm essentially just going to kind of walk through various things you can do with point data, um, raster data, and polygons. Um, I'm not going to play with linear features at all today. You know, you treat them the same as any of the other layers. Um, for the data set I'm playing with, it's actually um, for the point data are for trees for for Ken William Cedar. That uh, how far this is my brother. <laughs> um, how far the in his insanity is mapping from Google Earth for his hiking trail map. Uh, and he's mapping every single tree he can see from Google Earth. So he was about to put out the new version of the hiking map when Google updated the images, and uh, and he realized he could see the trees. So now he's uh, busy. With, has spent weeks. <laughs> Yeah, so he's on. Yeah, he's somewhere around ten thousand right now, and, and, and going strong. <laughs> so, um, so he's interested to see what I could come up with. So, this kind of putting this together was half an exercise, and fiddling with the trees, half an exercise, and you know, an example for you guys. Uh, yeah. No, I think I can work with so okay, so so that's kind of the data trees in the Cedarberg, um, and then I'm going to overlay that on a digital elevation model, and then I've got um, a fire history data set. So those are the kind of point raster and polygon um, data sets we're playing, playing with. Just some kind of basic house housekeeping. Um, so you know, usually I don't know. Usually I work from a, a Git repository, so it's kind of a version control system, and that often sets your working directory for you automatically. Um, Alternatively, you can set your working directory with setwd, um, the function. But either if you're sharing with other people, or if you're um, if you're working with big data sets that you don't want replicated all over your hard drive, I find it useful to kind of set a bunch of different working directories. So and there probably is a better way. But what I do is I'll kind of have a, a data working directory, a GIS working directory, and a results working directory. And I'll just make those objects to the path where I want to put things. Um, and then, uh, and then, if it's shared between multiple people, or I'm working on multiple computers, you can put this kind of if statement um, with a sys get end, get end user statement. So it's a sys get end kind of like is all about um, it returns various properties of the computer that you're working on. If you insert user, it'll give you the username back. So here I'm saying sysget end user equals Jasper, and that's in an if statement. So if that returns true, then it'll set up the data working directory, the GIS working directory, and the, and the results working directory that I that I've put in there. Um, if it returns false, then nothing happens. Um, and so it's quite cool if there's a lot of different people working on the same code because you can have you know stack of these underneath each other, and as long as nobody has the same username, um, then then it, then it's fine. One thing to note is just that on Mac it's user, on Windows it's username, and then uh, I'm not sure what it would be on Linux machines, but I'd imagine it should be user. So it's just a useful, yeah, useful trick for for dealing with projects, especially for GIS projects. You tend to have a GIS working directory somewhere with all of your big data in, um, rather than having to replicate them every time you start a new project. Okay. Um, and then I've just loaded a bunch of uh, different libraries. So library raster is by far the most advanced in terms of dealing with raster data. RGDAL is um, designed to commu communicate with GDAL, which is a separate uh, standalone program that actually installs when you install the RGDAL um, package. Um, and then uh, and then a couple of others. Library SP is also useful for handling shape files. And then I've got a few others here just for some neat tricks. Um, do MC is for running code in parallel. Um, it's quite a basic one for running code in parallel if you're not used to doing it. Um, and then library animation for making cool animations from your figures. Um, Dismo for fancy tricks in Google Earth. And Google Biz for even fancier tricks in Google Earth. Although I couldn't get that to work, which we'll see in Vegas. Um, cool. Okay. So always, you know, the first step is getting all of your data, cleaning your data, setting it up for your project. 
Um, but when you're dealing with JS data, obviously, first and foremost, is thinking about um, you know, projections and extents and you know, making sure everything actually, actually lines up and you're not just dealing with garbage. Um, so R usually uses the Podge 4 um, conventions. Um, so this is a kind of like a project string like this um, at the bottom here. And what I like to do is set a standardized projection when I get started. Um, so if you were using EPSG, this is the EPSG code for you're saying. So this is, um, in this case, it's UTM uh, zone 34S. And that's because I'm kind of working at a scale. Um, the extent, I think, is probably about 20 by 30 kilometers or something like that. Um, so it's kind of useful to be working in meters uh, in this case. So starting with point data, so in this case, the point data, I have our KML files, so they're um, straight out of Google Earth. Um, and you can read those in using read OGR. So that's, um, that's a GDAL um, function. Um, and it has this kind of syntax where you've got to have a DS, assign a DSM and then a layer. Uh, and it's depending on what kind of uh, file you're reading in. So this read OGR function is very powerful. It can um, it can read in all kinds of different formats from different programs and different drivers. But um, the one thing that varies a little is what you put under DSN and what you put under layer, and that can take you quite a while to work out. File well, can't find this, and um, so just be aware that depending on what kind of you know if it's a uh, ESRI file or a Google Word file. Various um, uh, potential subjects you got from that's going to vary. Ignore this for now. So this little paste WD is what I do to deal with the, the different working directory issues. So um, because I've set my dat WD up here um, somewhere, you know, so here my dat, dat WD is this long string. Um, you need to then um, paste the file name at the end of the working directory. So it, this just appends the, the name cdes.kml to the end of that working directory. Okay, so you draw in the file here called it raw points, um, and then uh, and then that says okay, it's an OGR um, data source with the KML driver, and it's got a thousand features. So I just trimmed this to a thousand trees from the data set that I had, um, and it has two fields. Um, so that's usually you know like uh, name and size, or so that's kind of the um, your um, the data table, your um, attribute table. Um, and then, so Podge Forstring returns, you know, what is the current projection? So here we have, you know, it's WGS84 long map now, or long map. Um, and we're working, I want to be working in UTM34S, so here you can apply SP transform to make it the, um, the projection you want. So mostly, it's, you know, if it's a layer of any kind, so most polygons and points and so on, um, SP transform works for you, but um, if it's a raster, then you need to do project raster. So those are two very useful functions for um, getting things back with the forth. I'm going through this quite quickly, but this document is up there and it's quite self-explanatory. So this is kind of just a quick overview of what's in it if you really need to do any of this. Sorry. We drew the points and then downloaded the KML file. Yeah. So the, the data set's not on Google Earth, but, um, but uh, it was drawn in Google Earth. Um, so I haven't shared the data with this. Um, so all the data that I'm using apart from these points is available online and the links are in the document. Um, but these points, um, I haven't actually asked my dad if I could share with people. <laughs> yeah, it's not a finished data set yet anyway. So. Yeah, they don't quite line up in the northern city area. Um, so you literally, in, in Google Earth, you kind of zoom around, find the features you want, you, you drop points, you drop pins, and then you can uh, extract all of those pins in one go. So you zoomed in close enough to see, okay, those are the trees I'm looking for. Drop a pin at every tree, and then extract extracted the entire set of, um, of trees. No, this is what, that was done in Google Earth. 
And then we got this cdis.kml file, which is a point file in Google Earth format with Google's um, projection to R with read.gr, and then reprojected it as UTM. Yeah. Yeah, so I can't remember exactly. Yeah, so this is, I think this is the standard um, well, uh, yeah, I can't remember exactly, but Google always use the same projection for all kind of Google Maps, Google Earth, Google Earth Engine, all that kind of thing. And then you convert it. It's kind of what's generated in Google Earth. Hey John. Um okay. Um so then okay, so I've transformed the points to the the right um, projection. So this is just to show you what that case O does. Um, so here I've struck, uh, you know, that was the date that added C for KML on the end, and that's part of the function. That makes sense. Um, and then you can look at, okay, well, what class um, are the data? So library SP and, and library RGDEL work with objects that are, are typically class spatial. And within class spatial, there's various subclasses. So you have spatial points. Um, if it's just a set of points, if it's a set of points with an attribute table, then it's spatial points data frame. Then you get spatial lines, you get spatial polygons, you get spatial grid, and they're all you know spatial grid and spatial grid data frame. Then. So there's a bunch of different kinds of spatial objects and there's different functions that work with the different ones. I find working with the spatial objects quite most parts, I always try and get them into something else if I can. Um, although spatial points still seems to be the best point, point there. Um, and so you can call from that object, you can say, okay, if you say coordinates points, you get a list of the coordinates of each of your, each of your points. Um, so in this case, I've just called head just so I get the first six records rather than 1,000 records, which would have been scrolling for a long time. So it's quite handy in that you can kind of, you almost, because it's a spatial points data frame, you can treat it like a normal data frame at home. Most of the normal data frame object um, functions work. Um, cool. And then if you want to, you know, extract that data as a normal data frame, you would just say as data frame coordinate points, and now x is just a normal data frame. So it's just the data frame with the two columns. Cool. Um, and I've kind of just done this to construct a scenario where I get to what you would usually be starting with, which is a text file with a bunch of coordinates in it. Yeah, so I started with a KML file, which usually one doesn't start with a KML file, you start with a bunch of you know, XY coordinates in an Excel spreadsheet or CSV file or something. But essentially, I've got this down to now X is, you know, read.csv, your set of things, here's your file. Um, so to convert X into a spatial object, you need to assign coordinates. Okay? Um, and there's two. Well, there's a bunch of different ways you can do that, but the, the simplest ones are um, if you just wanted to be a spatial object with an outer, with an outer um, attribute table, then you say coordinates is a function of your Latin long. Okay, so this is a, this is a formula here. It's got a little tilde. Is a function of your Latin long, and then it just makes a spatial points object. Um, but if you, so here it's class special points, but if you um, say, uh, on, just, yeah, so here I've just done the same again. The other way, because we know that x is just a set of Latin lines, you can just say coordinates x is x. But then what you end up with is a special points data frame, so you have an attribute table that has your x, y coordinates in it, as well as they have coordinates assigned. So it's just, a kind of a, just showing that there's different ways of doing it. But then I've done this to show you that spatial objects in R are a little weird and a little different to most objects in R and that they have these slots. So this is not a very good looking at sign. 
Um, so in this case, we've got x at forwards, we've got x at b box, x at quad four strings. And you can have slots within them as well. Um, and the slots are kind of weird. They're kind of like, you know, the normal objects that you would access in a data frame when you use the dollar sign. Um, but as far as I can work out, slots are an at sign so that you don't access them directly. Um, so lots of you can actually, you know, you can call x at coords and it'll get up the all coordinates. But um, reading up on the blogs and stuff, if ever you get one of the guys who develop these packages, they say do not touch any spots because if you touch because the spots, the idea is that they're hidden behind an at sign so that they they can mess with how the package works without breaking all the functions. Yeah. Hmm. Exactly, because the it's the same kind of idea. Because the package developers might change the way the object is oriented and how the functions are run. Yeah, exactly. So, so they say, yeah, you you should always use the functions to call any of the things you want, because if they change how the package works, then it's going to break the code. Yeah. So spots are very tempting because you can see it's right there, but you really shouldn't use it. <laughs>
Um, the other way of skipping that extent step, which I put in there just to explain it all to you, is you can just say property endpoint. Um, so you give it a special object that it can get an extent from, and then it'll just trim it, trim it to that. Um, and here, yeah, I just said plot DEM and points out of the points. And this, so this is the you know, this is the topography of the Cedarberg. So for those of you who know, uh, Algeria is about here. This is the NPEG parts up here. Three hooks over here. Velveta, um, Puckett's parts. Super, um, lots of cool hiking. Far more trees than you would expect, I think. Um, and especially considering this is only an eighth of the trees that are meant to be in this is the Tanka Peru for those who never go hiking but only go to Big Friday. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of the layout of, of, of the data we're playing with. Um, and this is just kind of a, a basic plotting. I didn't set any of the colors or whatever. This is just uses terrain colors, but so. Uh, see the trees, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's plot raster as the function and it, it identifies it based on the class of the data set. Um, the points. That's, no, that's speculative. So you can just put that over the top of the record. Um, so now we've got this digital elevation model, but there's all kinds of cool things you can calculate from a DEM. Um, and so, um, one of the very handy functions for basic ones is this function terrain that allows you to calculate slope, aspect, um, topographic position index, which is kind of a measure of how many cells drain to that cell in the landscape. So I'm using that for a project that I'm working on um, exploring topographic effects on microclimate, and that's like a cool measure of you know, cold air drainage to that site. The combination of topographic position index and then flow direction will give you an idea of how much cold air drainage you have. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So you can say the neighborhood because it's based on. Well, yeah. So it'll say it'll the neighborhood is is constructed by the number of cells. So we know our cells are already 90 meters. So you can't say 100 by 100, but you can say, you know, the first set of 90s around it, or two sets away, or three sets away. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it has to be a unit of 90. Whatever your grid size, yeah. So if it's one kilometer, then it'll have to be, you know, one kilometer units, or so on. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's pretty, you can actually, I think you can set a distance to it, and then it goes, but it'll go to the nearest unit of your cell size. And so these are some of the basic ones you can calculate using terrain, um, but then if you want to calculate something different, um, using, a, you know, for a focal cell, you can use this function called focal, focal. and so you can, you know, calculate all kinds, anything you want, really, um, uh, depending on what makes sense to you. Um, but then if you've got a really big raster, it can take a long time. So then there's this other function in a library called spatial.tools called raster engine. And that automatically parallelizes the code. So it works out how many cores you've got in your computer and uses them all to try and do the calculation on the raster, um, which is kind of handy. Um, I've not tried it. <laughs> I, yeah, so I should put a disclaimer there and say, like, I haven't actually tried it. I've only ever parallelized it myself without, you yeah. I only found that today. Cool. So it gives you all these different, um, you can calculate all these different variables from your DEM, but then, you know, we still have weird problems because things like aspect um, is circular, you know? So you know, um, 359 is only two degrees away from one, and then you have 180 and 182 are the same difference. You know, and it's, uh, it kind of becomes quite difficult when you're dealing with the statistics of it. So typically what people do is they take the sine of aspect and the cosine of aspect, and that gives you measures of east-westness and north-southness, which you have to interpret in weird and wonderful ways. And they're not quite linear either. <laughs> but, uh, 
but they're probably better to play with than than just aspect alone, unless unless you class an aspect into the cardinal direction and so on. Um, and typically, the best is probably just to work with something like solar radiation because it kind of integrates across all of But it depends on what your application would be. But here, I was just trying to show you that you can do you know, direct calculations on your raster. So in this case, aspect is a raster that we created up here. And you can literally just say, take the sign of that entire raster, and it just converts all the cells in that raster and it to you, which is pretty cool. And you can do almost anything with them. So you can say, what is aspect times slope? And you can, you know, what's aspect times slope divided by roughness on, by, to the square root of flow direction and all those kinds of things. Um, so you can, yeah. So uh, as as usual, I will I will let you do anything. It's just more a question of you know what did you tell it to do and does that make make any sense? Um, it'll do exactly what you said it to do. It's not necessarily what you want it to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm. But it's convincing. Um, so okay. Um, but the one thing about doing these kinds of calculations is that then the names of the data underlying that object often are weird. So in this case, so we made the object east-west, but when you made the calculation, it just called the underlying data layer, which is very helpful, because north-south is also called layer. <laughs> and then the digital elevation model is called SRTM underscore 40 underscore 19, which is the tile that I extracted it from. Um, so that's not very useful either. So what I'm doing here is I then rename all of the layers to, to the names I want, um, and then you can stack them. So you can you know, take multiple rasters and create um, a kind of a set of them. If they're all the same extent and resolution, you can create one big stack, and then you can do all kinds of cool things with that kind of set of you know, three-dimensional, I suppose, in a way, rasters. It's especially useful if you've got, you know, um, the same thing through time, if it's NDVI data, or if it's fire layers, if you rasterize, which we'll do in a minute, or this kind of thing. Um, so you create the stack, um, and then you have this object called Topo. So now it's a raster stack. You can also do raster brick, which um, I find is almost exactly the same as stack, but it's somewhat less, um, less useful for many functions. Although if you find a cool use for it, then you know. So here it gives us our dimensions. You know, we've got the number of rows, the number of columns, the, the number of total number of cells, and then the number of layers. Uh, in this case, we're up to eight layers. And then all the other stuff, you know, max values, min values, and so on and so forth. Cool. So other cool functions with the raster package are things like rasterize and aggregate. Um, so rasterize. So in this case. Um, so what I've done here is I've taken my points, so my sets of trees, and I've rasterized them to the digital elevation model. So I've used the, essentially all it uses is the resolution and the extent and the projection. It'll give you an, well, usually it gives you an error if the projections aren't the same, which is useful. And then uh, the function I'm applying is count. So essentially what I'm saying here is count how many trees fall in each cell across the seedbird and give me a, a raster with those numbers. Um, and then you can plot it. And this is what it looks like. So you don't really see very much because they're 90 by 90 meter cells over a large area, 20 by 30 kilometer or so area. Um, so then you might think, okay, well, to see it well, maybe we want to make the cells bigger. Um, so you can then take that and aggregate it. So here we aggregate this raster by a factor of three. So now each cell is 290 meters across. Um, and now it looks a little bit more a little bit more interesting. Does that make sense? Um, so if you if you want to just like force the resolution, you can just use aggregate very easily. Um, I can't remember now. There's another function to go the other way, which obviously you don't want to use most of the time. So then, I think Yeah, number of trees per second. Aggregate. So we aggregate? What's that? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. So I didn't set the I didn't set the color ramp, which would be useful if you're interested in where are they ones. Uh, yeah. And then you can also do this. So here we've said uh, plot density greater than ten, and then make them all red. So here we have this is actually just zero to one, uh, and then it gives it, it's red if it's one, and it's uh, 
I don't know why R does this sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, so then it just pops from all, all, all the sites where you have more than 10 feet. But this is just to show you the kind of um, essentially what's happened there because I used the logical statement, it's turned that whole raster into just a grid of trues and falses. That makes sense. Uh, and then it's part of all the truth. Cool. So, yeah. The other really cool um, function to fiddle with is this calc. So, you can do really crazy calculations with rasters using calc. You can even do fit linear models and stuff using rasters. Um, although, I'm pretty sure it takes a long time. I saw a blog post about it. I was like, I'm not going to try that. <laughs> um, okay, so moving on to polygon. Um, field equals? Oh, name. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, good point. So, because the um, points, the points object is the, um, can have multiple, it can have an attribute table with multiple fields, um, you need to pick one of them to do your operation. So, in this case, we're just counting the occurrence of a point, so it didn't matter what field we were using. But say you wanted to, you can actually, like, you know, say your attribute table's got the basal area of each of the trees, um, then you can have function equals sum, and it'll sum the basal area of all the trees in that area. So it's super powerful once you start you know, playing with those different, um, yeah, good point there. Yeah, but yeah, so in the raster you can only have one field. But in, uh, in the points, I can put you've got an attribute table, you can have lots of data. Um, Mike, can you check if there's anyone at the other end of this? Because I'm hearing myself like 30 seconds later. Yeah, but you runs on a 30 second delay. I can turn up my sound off. <laughs> Somebody keeps whispering stuff in my ear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's it. Okay, so polygon. So here we're playing with the um, the fire record for all the um, Cape Nature Reserves in the Western Cape, um, which I downloaded here. Um, rule number one is don't trust them, but um, but they're there and so they're fun to play with and they're the best we've got for now. So um, so firstly, get the data, you know, uh, look at the projection, reproject, and then crop it to the extent of our area. And we made this object E earlier. Um, and then that gets us down to fire layers and the area we want in the right projection. Um, and now there's lots of things you can do with spatial polygons um, objects. Um, the first thing you should not do is call structure, the str function, which I don't know, I find it quite useful to call str on lots of objects when you call them into R because then it shows you how they're constructed. But if you do that on a spatial polygons object, it will give you, it calls structure on every single layer in that in that um, in that set of polygons, essentially, and that uh, on every polygon in that layer, and it'll spew out. You know, in, in this case, there's like a thousand fires or something like that, and it just like spews out random stuff for a long time. <laughs> you spend a lot of time hitting escape, I think it would stop. Um, so it's better just to for almost all the spatial objects just to type in the name of the spatial object, and then it'll show you. Have a bunch of different things. So here it's a special polygon data frame. We've trimmed it just to the Cedarberg, so in this case we're dealing with only 114 um, polygons. Uh, it gives us our projection and so on. Um, and in this case it tells us, okay, the attribute table has 16 different uh, columns. Um, and it hasn't presented them very well here, but that's just the screen resolution issue. Screen. So because it's a data frame, special polygons data frame, you can call head. And it just shows you the top, the first you know, six rows of everything. It's got a fire ID, fire code, month, year, reserve, um, and all that kind of thing. And then a whole bunch of notes. And the notes are quite fun to read. Um, there's all kinds of random stuff in there. Um, and then you know, fire area and perimeter and so on. Um, so then you can look at the names. And so that's just the column names for that data frame object. There's all these different things. Um, and then you can look at, you know, just like a normal data frame, you can call a class, is it a factor, is it numeric, is it character, all that kind of thing. Um, but the one thing is because we've now trimmed the extent from a much bigger file, so it was, it's literally covered the whole of the Western, uh, 
you know, the whole of the Western Cape. Now we've trimmed it just in Cedarburg region. Um, the levels and the factors still have all the other regions that were trimmed out. Um, so these are all the different reserve names, but we know, and especially by calling unique on the reserve, we've only got the Cedarburg in our data set. Um, so you can drop all of those levels. So the levels are often used in plotting things. So you'll say, um, you know, plot some or other data by this factor, and it'll give you like a different bar plot for each one. And obviously, if we did this, we're going to have um, 27 empty ones and one one bar, which could be this big in the corner. Which, yeah. So you want to drop those levels if you don't need them. So you can still call drop levels like you do on a normal data frame and everything. It's quite handy. And then if you just plot a spatial polygon data frame, it literally just plots the outlines of all of the polygons. Um, so you have this kind of spaghetti ish mess or broken glass, or I don't know what you like to think of it. Um, uh, and that's obviously not very useful for many of our applications. One interesting thing here is that the top right corner is completely devoid of any files. Um, that's just a marking wall. Um, and that's because this is this is the tanker crew, so that's not likely to burn in a hurry. Uh, okay. Can't burn sand, exactly. You can, but it takes a while. <laughs> but, um, so then we can call rasterize on, um, on the set layer. Um, and to see how many files we have occurring in each of the cells. So here, um, this is just for demonstration purposes. I made a new column um, in the data in the data table, which you can do just like you do in a normal data frame, giving the data frame name and then dollar and your variable name, and then assigning a value to, to one to the number of rows and file there. So that's um, uh, that's a unique ID number for each file, essentially. That makes sense. So that essentially has added a new column to the attribute table for the special polygons object of one to 118. Something like that. um, that's literally just to show you that you can do that. I didn't need to do that for this, for this purpose, but I did anyway. Um, and then here I've said fire. Count, um, I've created an object of fire count by rasterizing the fire layers to the digital elevation model based on this field ID that I made, and once again using the function count. So it's literally just count the number of um, files that intersect with that cell. And then there's, you can actually define different ways for it to rasterize it. So you can say um, if it touches that cell, or if it covers the middle of that cell, or if the entire cell is within the polygon. So those will obviously give you different results. So, um, But I haven't included that here. I've just gone, I think the default is if it covers the middle of the cell. Um, and then you plot it, and you have something like this, which is pretty cool. Um, so the interesting thing about this is that this is the Algeria kind of office and campsite, and you know these are most of the fires. Uh, and then you know this is a, there's a bunch of farms. Well, there's a farm here, and then there's some farms here, which are probably driving these fires. And then that's near the uh, Pakes Pass. So there's a clear kind of I don't know. To me, there's a clear imprint of um, human influence. And it's, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, they're pretty good at it. Um, they are pretty good at getting most. So this record goes back to the like 40s. So they probably weren't that good at it all the way back then. Um, especially considering now it takes the reserve manager like a couple of hours to drive around the outside of the reserve before he even gets onto. You know, that's by tar road before he gets in. Um, I'm pretty sure back then access was very difficult. Okay. Um, so now what I want to do is rasterize each fire layer as its own raster. Um, because then you can do all kinds of other cool stuff with it. So I want to make each of the polygons that are in that, sorry, so I've got a layer of multiple fire polygons and I want to make each polygon its own raster and then make a stack. Yeah, so now I have a stack of 118 fires. Um, and so um, firstly, we need to kind of have a look at the underlying data to see how we want to do it. So you might think, okay, cool, you know, these are the different things we have. Maybe we want to do it by common fires. So often the managers will go out and they'll map um, these polygons, but often they'll map one fire as multiple polygons depending on where they, where they start and finish. So if it's a really big fire and it takes more than a day to, for them to map the burn scar, they'll kind of finish that polygon on that side of the road and then they'll draw another one on the other side of the road. But meanwhile, there's one fire that jumped the road. Um, 
So you might want to rasterize things that occurred on the same date. Um, so here we've got a start date, looks interesting. So if we look at file layer start date, we see there's a whole bunch of NAs in there. Um, so obviously that's not going to be a useful thing for us to rasterize the data by. Um, so, and then this is just a little calculation to show you that it's quite easy to do, you know, calc pulling this data out of the object and calculate it. Um, and that's just the proportion of uh, burnt area without the start date. Um, so it's the sum of the burnt areas for each of the fires and then which ones didn't have um, didn't have dates. And so it's like 13% essentially of the, of the fires that occurred don't have start dates. But fortunately we do have year, and so we've got a bunch of other things here and one of them is being year, and mostly we can get year and month if we wanted to, but I think year is enough for this demonstration. Um, and essentially we've got 70 different years um, from 1945 to 2014. And now we're going to loop through every year and rasterize every polygon, um, every, all the fires in every year. Um, but there's a bunch of issues here. So firstly, <clears throat> this might create quite a large object in R's memory. And if you create a large object in R's memory, R moves slower and slower and slower until it stops. Um, and, uh, and but fortunately, we can get around this by writing each file, each file out, uh, each raster out to a file. So you can make a, this is where a TIFF is quite handy, you make a GeoTIFF, and then you add a new uh, raster layer to, to, to that TIFF. So you'll end up with um, a GeoTIFF that has multiple rasters in it. Um, uh, and then the other thing is you can dump any unwanted objects from memory in the beginning with R image. You know common sense, if you've got lots of big objects that you drew in earlier, you might, may, might as well get rid of them. Um, so the other thing is there's a lot of cells in the raster, or if there are a lot of cells in the raster, this can take a long time um, anyway, even if you've got you know, nothing in R's memory, if it's a really big raster, um, it can take a very long time, so it might be worth trying to parallelize your code, and if your computer's got more than one core, use all of them. Um, and then, uh, I'm going to have to read this one. Oh, and then the other thing is here, so in, for this thing, I'm quite keen to, you, to have empty rasters for years when there were no fires. Um, so you'll see I'll put, a, I'll put an if statement in to say if there, was a, if there was no fire in that year, plug in this empty raster full of zeros. Um, and, then, uh, and then the last thing here is just that uh, you know, if you're running the same script multiple times and you're doing an operation like this where you create um, you know, a bunch of rasters from a polygon or whatever, and you don't want to have to do that every time, but you also don't want to have multiple scripts where here I prepped all my data, now I've got all my data, and so on and so forth, you can wrap an if statement around this function file exists. So we wrote out, you know, so we're going to write out a file as a TIFF file. But uh, you can say file that exists that wherever you wrote that TIFF file, and then say if that file exists, then don't do this operation. Um, if that makes sense. So, okay. So I've tried to explain all that. Now I'm going to show you the complicated code to try and explain what I've done. So step one, you can ignore that's just removing things we didn't want. Step two is creating the list of years from the first year to the last year. This gives us a file name. Um, and then what I've done here is I've timed it just to, so I'm doing this now the first way is, is not um, parallelized and then I do it again parallelized. There isn't actually much difference between the two because this is quite a small data set. But, uh, but you can use the system.time to time the process and you open the bracket and then just end the bracket at the end of the whole function. Um, and then so this is that statement I was trying to say. So I'm saying if this file doesn't exist, then do everything inside the curly bracket. Um, and if that file does exist, do nothing and move on to the next step. So it's quite handy, you know, if, if doing all the stuff that's in those curly brackets takes a very long time, this is a very useful function to have so you don't end up having to make a cup of tea every time you start your code again. Um, okay. And then inside, so I'm saying, because it's an if statement, uh, so if file that exists and you put in the file name, it will return true. Right. And so if statement, if it gets true, it will then do everything that's in the, in the curly bracket. 
So if you've done it before, it'll say, if the file doesn't exist, and it says, oh, but the file exists. So that returns false. So it ignores everything in the instance. So it has to be the negative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, sorry, so for those of you who aren't familiar, the putting an exclamation mark in front of a logical statement gives you the negative. Yeah. And so I've said, if the file does exist, um, do that. And then because this is a, this is just a normal for loop, there are six ways of doing it, but I just did it in for loop because when I parallelize it, I use a for each loop, which is the parallelized version of for loop. Um, and so I create an output list, and then for each year, if, so, um, for each year, from one to the number of years we've got, set the year, and then it says um, if there are no files in that year, then output the raster with the same extent and resolution as the digital elevation model with all the values being zero. So that just fills in a blank. Um, Ransom from years we don't have fires, but if there are you know, more than zero fires in that year, then rasterize um, all the fire, all the all the fires that occurred in that year. Uh, yeah, all the fires which occurred in that year. So the, uh, using function count, uh, and if you say background is zero, in this case, there's some kind of feature that NA is the background. So zero to uh, Cool, and then it ends the loop. Stacks them all together in one thing and writes them out. So write the raster with the equal and write them out raster. Okay, and that took all of 12 and a half seconds. So obviously parallelizing a code is not really going to get you that much more speed. Um, but here I've done a for each loop using dupar um, in the slide we do MC. Trust me, this can take a very long time if you've got a big rest. Um, so I've been doing all the fires of the Cape Peninsula at 30 meters, which ends up being, um, so this data set 70,000 cells. The Cape Peninsula at 30 meters is something like almost 8 million, um, so it takes a lot longer. Um, so going parallel is useful. Well, it's literally, it's kind of divided by the number of cores you have, and then, but then subtract the kind of setup time. Um, so the one thing here is, and I'll show you now, so now we say, for this bit, it's slightly different, so we've got to firstly set the computer up to do parallel, so you say register do MC, and it sets the computer up, it's like, okay, I'm going to use a bunch of cores, here I've said three, because my computer has four cores, but it's quite handy to go and check your email and work on a Word document and stuff while it's doing it, something in the background. Um, this is just setting files, the timing bit, this is the skip it if it's done with the four bit. Um, and then you do a for each loop, um, which is slightly different. And I'm not really going to explain the syntax. If you want to get into this kind of stuff, you should just read a couple of blog posts. It's quite easy. But, uh, but essentially, it's for each year. When you get all the results, combine them into a stack. Um, so the stack is a, is a function, which then puts all the rasters into one stack. Use the packet raster, and then do in parallel everything inside the squiggly bracket. And then everything inside the squiggly bracket is the same. As um, as what we did in the, in the for loop before, and yeah. anything, anything. Yeah, do MC isn't really the best one. I don't think there's snow, do snow, do parallel. There's a bunch of different ones. But we should probably chat about. I think that's probably worth a, a whole session. Yeah. Very worth doing it, and if you it's a very if you've got access to a cluster, um, and you're wanting to run R code in a cluster, then it's very useful to know how to parallelize your code. Otherwise, you're just using lots of memory, but you're not using multiple cores. Um, so you so you yeah, if you can work out how to parallelize your code and send it to the cluster, um, it can really make things faster a uh, big way. Uh, but it does. But using a for for each loop like this, it requires your job to be able to be split up neatly into into separate units, um, and that's often the biggest challenge. Is like, how can I split this that I can give these these jobs to different computers, and they can still make sense of them and return something that makes sense. Um, so yeah, that's that's one big challenge. Yeah. Uh, 
So yeah, so this took, uh, what, two seconds faster, or 1.5 seconds faster, but then you'll see that there's this user system in a lapse, and the user is um, just the time taken to process the code, okay? So, uh, and when you do two, when you register do MC and all that kind of stuff, then it obviously takes a little while for it to set itself up as a, as a cluster, a little bit of time at the end to stop being a cluster and return everything to you. But um, the bigger the data set, the, the bigger your gain. But that was just to demonstrate you know, how one would do it. Um, okay, and so because I wrote the file out, I don't have it in memory anymore. And now I have to read the file in. And so if I'm reading in um, a file with multiple rasters, um, usually you'll use the function stack. So you go straight to, to calling in all the different rasters separately. You can actually, I think nowadays, you can actually just say raster and it knows, OK, make a raster stack. Um, but usually you used to have to just say stack. And then you can look at it. So now we've got 70 different layers within this raster stack. Um, and these are all their names. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we can, so the names are pretty random. Fires annual 90 meters one, fires annual 90 meters two, fires annual, you know, that's not very handy. So here you can uh, rename them. So we've, I've renamed them by saying paste fire years. So each fire is now 1945, 1946, 1947. Um, and so when you plot it, you just get you know, a bunch of different fires like this. The yellow ones are the empty years. Um, and that's obviously not very, you know, that's not that useful. It's useful if you want to stare at them and you don't have 70 of them or more. Um, but there are sexier ways of dealing with your data, so this is just for fun, really. But it's quite a nice way of showing what you can do with your data and illustrating to people um, with this library animation. Um, and then you have to install the standalone soft software called Image Magic. There's a couple of others, but Image Magic is one of the easiest. You can then create an animation of your of your of your data. Um, so I've done this file exists again because this takes a while, and then you um, you actually save out the data as a GIF. So you have save GIF, and then inside it you go through a for loop where you plot each of your file layers, and uh, and it's one file and it's got each of the file layers printed on top of each other. Um, and if you open it in the wrong program, it just looks like a lot of different images underneath each other, but if you open an HTML, you get something that looks like this, which is still kind of somewhat random. Yeah, let me get there. As you can see, the years changing at the top. And these are the different files that happen in the different years. I should have got the soundtrack to it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in here, um, so here you have interval, and I've set it to half a second a year. Otherwise, we'd have to do 70 years. Yeah, so that's it. So you can do anything with this. So you can put your digital elevation model underneath this, and you can put this um, up as a shed, like a, a semi transparent set of layers on top of it. Um, so you can make all kinds of cool things. This is just the Kind of the basic to show you how one would do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then it'll. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, this is just a demonstration. Fires aren't bad. People are bad. Fires are good. Fires are good. It's a question about data, actually. Um, yeah, there's definitely fewer fires in the beginning of the record, but I think what's happened is that the fires for a year are lumped in the early record. So they didn't, they kind of drew polygons wherever they thought the fires were, and then at the end of the year they kind of put them all together. And so, I mean, these would have only have been digitized like earliest in the 90s. Um, and those guys would have gone and found all the old maps that the, the reserve manager had drawn some line on. You know, and probably drawn it on successive years because he wants to know the felt age on his new map for his new year management. Term. So yeah, the data do get thick years when you get back. So that's kind of boring, but uh, but then we can do the same thing. But now we can use take advantage of the kind of raster calculation. So what I've done here is 
Um, I've added this little bit, I've added sum here, and I've made it one to i. So that means add up for each image that you make and give me the sum of all files up to that point. And so now um, what this bit does is it creates um, an animation that then adds up as each file happens and it overlays it. So you can see you're in the 70s and the 80s. So you can see where all, all the fires are happening, big ones, small ones, uh, kind of two times. It's pretty cool. And you can see when the big ones happen too, which is quite fun. And then it starts again. So it's quite fun. And I mean, these, these, these really are crusty animations from the, for the stuff you can do. There's some amazing stuff you can do. Um, but this was just minimal effort um, to show you what's, what's an option. Um, and then there's, I mean, visualizations, I didn't really go into, there's a ton of stuff you can do. Library Raptivers is really cool. Um, you can do things like this, so this is the uh, digital elevation model, and then it can kind of give you the side profiles um, of what you can see <laughs> in that kind of thing, uh, if that's what you're after. Uh, Contour Plot, I, I did something wrong, couldn't work it out, and take this out. It looks pretty cool, and it's a button all big 1000s that I had drawn all over it. That looks like an old school topo map with the contour. Um, and then perspective is quite fun. Unfortunately, this is because the cells are so dense, um, you can't see the empty squares, but this is, you know, empty squares with lines. And um, it's actually a cool way of looking at all kinds of data with the perspective um, function. Is yeah, so there's, so there's a bunch of interactive functions, so you can make the figure and then if, if it's, um, you know, if it's an R Markdown document or something like this that you have open in a HTML in a, bra in a, in a browser, then you can actually fiddle with them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very much. So. It's very, so, I mean, if you, exactly, and you can show it as a video, you know, you can animate that and post it on a website, which is quite fun. Um, it's easiest if it's point data, but if it's, a, if you've got a set of layers, you, know, you can make things that you can, you can convert things into polygons um, and then, Show the different polygons through time, or or the rest. Of it. Yeah, exactly. Or you can rasterize it to a grid if you just want points, or or yeah, lots of options. Pretty fun. If you yeah, if you you decide what grid you want. Um, and then and then you can rasterize. So that's what I was doing in the beginning when I showed you those almost empty plots. That's when I'd rasterize the trees, but I'd rasterize them at 90 meters, and they're too small to really see much. Then I made them bigger. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. If you No, I think what you're saying is you've got a bunch of points and you don't know what the grid was. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I mean the easiest way of doing that is you just make a matrix um, and you expand the matrix and then you can you can just take a raw matrix and say rasterize. Yeah. And then another cool thing is you can you can master photos, so you can read a photo in as a raster object and fiddle with photos. Um, but obviously, there's a lot of pixels in a photo, so think about the size and, and resolution of your photo before you fiddle with that. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so lots of options. Um, so we have the contour part, the perspective part, and then yeah, some cool tricks with Google Earth. This is. Uh, Library of my uh, I think this is still Rats of um, 
you can do this GMAP um, and you can say type a satellite and it gives you the pulls out the Google Earth image. So if you're online and you run the function, it pulls out the Google Earth image and you can draw all your points on it. Which is pretty fun. Uh, no. 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 So you can get that automatically. There's a bunch of there's some crazy stuff you can do with R and Google, and Google Earth and Google Earth Engine and all that. Um, and a lot of them you do need an API key, but uh, but a lot of them are fine. They let you do it anyway. Uh, it's pretty cool. So this one's just a normal one. And then if you thought that was fancy, then the thing that was coming next would have been way fancy, but it didn't work. Um, <laughs> so, and I couldn't quite figure out why. So that was my morning was spent. Essentially, this piece of code is meant to make a you know, a map kind of like this, but then it's interactive, and it's just like having Google Earth in your, in your. So, so essentially, yeah. So it calls it calls um, Google Charts, which is you know a Google you know, platform, and it, which allows you to create maps in your website and so on. So in this R calls the Google Charts creates the map in your um, in your HTML document, and then you can like interact with your points. It's quite fun. But if it doesn't work, then you get lots of this stuff. Blah, blah, blah. There's all my points. Fortunately, I trimmed it to 20 points once I realized the first time. I was like, this creates a lot of output if I don't, um, if I don't get it right. OK. Um, but then what about our first cedars? And I actually didn't really get to analyzing the cedars at all. But, uh, but the one thing I thought was important to show you is just how to extract the data to use in a data table. So. And a couple of other things. So here we have that topo object. Remember, that's the, the stack of all the different topographic features. So it's the digital elevation model, the slope, the aspect, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you can add things to that um, stack of rasters just like you would add a new column to a data frame by saying, in this case, I am, I'm adding fire count as a topo, topo dollar sign fire add fire count. I can add the density of trees as well. And then if you just say plot topo, usually it just plots a, a grid of all of the um, rasters in that stack. In this case, it seems to it seemed um, convinced that it had to put them underneath each other. Um, so there's the EM, the slope, the east westness, north southness, um, topographic position index, topographic roughness, roughness, flow direction, all these different things. Um, okay, and then that was to set up the analyses I was going to do, going to do, which I haven't done, um, which is about you know what drives the decline of zeta. Um, but then in terms of putting your data out, um, like I said just now, you could just, if you want to make a raster, you create a matrix and you, you say raster that matrix, and it will you know, make a raster. Um, it works the other way around too. So here I'd say add data frame topo, and it turns that whole um, set of rasters that are overlaying each other into uh, a data frame. So it unwraps each raster into a set of columns. And then, so now each row in your data frame is one cell in your raster. So this function here created this object that which was then 70,000 rows deep, and it has many layers of that have to be like nine or ten. Uh, that's the same column. And then you can just fiddle with it like you do normal data. So you know, we're just plotting, but uh, see the density is a function of fire, but uh, density is a function of topographic roughness, elevation, or softness. So, so you end up with this you know, usual kinds of sus suspect. So that's one way if you want all of the data in your set of um, in your set of raptors. But say you only want the data, you almost probably the most common thing we all do is we create a set of layers, or a set of raptors or something, and then we want to cook cut out all the points. And you know, we've got a bunch of points for species or something, and we want to cook cook cut all the values for those species and have that in the table, um, that you just do with extract. So here we say extract top of points. Uh, no, it works with shape files. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you like. So you, you just have you just give it the, the spatial object you want and the points and then we'll put it out. The other cool thing about this extract function is that it allows you to put buffer. I didn't, I forgot to demonstrate here, but if within this extract you would say comma buffer equals and then a number of, like a number which gives you a distance around it. So say you've got, um, say you've got 
climate data at one kilometer resolution and you've got locality data that's only accurate to five kilometers. And what a lot of people would then do is they'll they'll resample their raster to be five kilometer cell and they'll extract the points where wherever their points sit, right? The problem with that is this can be my five kilometer cell, but my point is here. And the area around that is five kilometers and it goes all the way down here too. Um, so so raster to resampling your grid to five kilometers isn't actually a good thing to do at all if the uncertainty is in your point, not in your, in your cell. Does that make sense? So what you do is you say extract blah 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 from a buffer equals five kilometers, and then what it does is from this point it extracts all the cells that are within five kilometers of that cell. And then it returns the object as a list. Um, so then you know with each entry in your list being the full set of cells that are within five kilometers of each of the points. That makes sense. Um, yeah. And and then I just put some stuff down here. So I've used most of these just in talking, but uh, you know, another important thing is actually writing out your data. Um, so write OGR for any kind of shape files, any object that says that the class says spatial beforehand, and then write raster you see a few times, and then it's often just useful to use save or save dot image to save your whole workspace, and that's essentially like saving a, an MXD in RGIS or something like that. Uh, you know, so you save all the objects that are already been formatted as one of the uh, data file, and you can read that in whenever you want. So very close to that. Um, and then that's it. Um, and then, yeah, this is just the session info. If anything doesn't work, this is, these are the settings on my my version of R on my computer and stuff like that. Any questions? <laughs> I have a t-shirt to give away, which is something Scott myself can get back on this television.